It is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's panel. Tonight we have filmmaker from the Gene, Chris Durant. We have Dr. Cedric Fischat, Cornell University Professor of Molecular Biology and Genetics. And we also have Cornell University Associate Professor of Molecular Biology and Genetics, Dr. Maria Garcia. Welcome. So I want to start off this evening um, with a question um, for you, Chris. Uh, you are the director on the gene. So can you please just share a bit about um, yourself and, and your work on this film? Absolutely. Thanks, Nancy. And thanks, everyone, for watching. We're so excited to have this discussion with you all this evening. So do shoot your questions in, and we'll try and get to as many as possible. So I'm one of two directors on the gene. My colleague, Jack Youngelson, did the first part. I worked on the second part. Um, and for us, really, this has had a long history. We both worked on a film a few years ago based on, with Ken Burns, the, the filmmaker, and the writer Sid Mukherjee um, about the history of cancer. It's actually quite a, a fun, upbeat film, despite the, despite the appearance of the subject matter. And so when Sid wrote his second book and was looking for a team to bring that to PBS, it was a natural fit for Ken, Barrett Goodman, the senior producer, Jack and myself to, to reunite. And we were so excited to do that because Sid is just a fantastic writer, a fantastic storyteller. If you don't know his book, uh, on cancer or his book, The Gene. They're really wonderful pieces of, of art, really. And that was a great starting off point for us. For, and so we, we leapt at the opportunity. One of the big things that we did was bring present day stories to the film. And we can talk more about that later, but that's me and looking forward to your questions. Great, thank you. Dr. Maria Garcia, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do at Cornell University? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me he here. I'm very excited to uh, share what I do and, and I, I'm excited about the questions that the audience may have about this wonderful documentary. Uh, so my name is Maria Garcia. I'm an associate professor at Cornell University. And what, I, what we do in my lab is to use mouse. We don't work on, ma on humans uh, per se or humans genetics, but we use on mouse genetics and we use mice to unravel and identify what are the genes that are involved in, in creating congenital birth defects in humans as well. Uh, because of the similarities between mice and humans, we can do these things. And our approach basically um, makes use of chemical mutagens to introduce random mutations into DNA. So we are basically uh, recreating in mice uh, the same conditions that happen in nature that create mutations on our own DNA. But we can do it without creating any harm to humans in this process. And uh, we just identify uh, phenotypes in, in the animals that we dissect uh, that recreate some of the congenital birth defects that are frequently found in humans, including spina bifida, uh, cardiovascular defects uh, at birth, uh, morphological defects during development, many of the mutations that we actually work on uh, produce embryonic lethality uh, in, in animals. So that's what uh, we do, and I'm open to questions both about my research and about the documentary. Oh, that's fascinating. Thank you so much for, for being here with us tonight. And Dr. Cedric Fashat, um, can you start, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work at Cornell University? Yeah. Thanks, thanks Nancy, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, so yeah, I'm actually originally from France. I actually moved to the US about uh, 20 years ago, and uh, my lab uh, actually is studying the part of the genome, the human genome, that you haven't heard much about yet in this documentary, um, which is the part outside of the genes. And it turns out that the DNA that encodes for your proteins for your, your genes occupies only 1% of the human genome. So the human genome is a big place. And we actually don't know much about the other 99% of that genome. What I mean by much is like, we do not understand what this DNA means, where does it come from, uh, what, what's, what's the function of this, this DNA. And it turns out another interesting uh, fact about this, and this is really what we study, is that a big fraction of that non-genic DNA uh, is derived, descending, is directly descended from viruses. And of course, all of you have heard about viruses today, uh, for sure. 
And it turns out about 10% of the human genome is vowel derived. And in my lab, we are trying to understand both the good things and the bad things about this vowel DNA. And we've learned a lot of things, us and many others, along the years on how this uh, vowel DNA can contribute to disease, but also uh, can be beneficial for, uh, for our, our cells and actually can be repurposed for cellular function is really what we're studying in my lab. Uh, so I'm really happy to be here and trying to answer all, any questions that you might have about DNA, human genome, and how we can use also this technology like CRISPR that, that we've heard about, which we are using in my own lab, uh, to try to understand you know, what is the functional meaning of all this DNA. Yeah. Great, thank you. I feel like we have such a wealth of uh, knowledge between between the three. I'm really excited to, to jump in and ask some questions. Um, Dr. Garcia, I'm going to start with you. What makes the human genome, you know, such a compelling story? You know, why, why should we care? Well, because it's our genome, right? <laughs> so we, it should be in our best interest to know as much as we can about ourselves and only by understanding who we are, uh, we can know and learn about our potential and um, all the things that can go wrong in the process and how to fix them as well. Great, thank you. Um, and Dr. Fischak, you know, how is genetics changing the way that, that medicine is practiced? Well, I think a gene, a, a human genome sequence was a big deal. You know, I mean, one of the things that was now mentioned so far, but it's really kind of amazing, is like to, to decode, to read, what we call now the reference genome, which is like the canonical human genome sequence. It took $3 billion in 13 years to get that kind of canonical genome, which is a composite genome, if you want, from like representative of all human beings. But things have changed dramatically since then. In fact, in the last, last 10 years or so, because now we can actually sequence a human genome, your genome, your personal genome, for less than a thousand dollars and in a few hours. So just put that in perspective to the three billion dollars, 13 years to get a somewhat universal genome if you want. So things, so things are moving very, very quickly in genetics. And indeed, this is, these things are coming into the clinic readily, uh, directly right now. And you can in that, indeed now, um, sequence the genome of a, of a patient that gets into the hospital with an unknown uh, disease or an unknown, you know, uh, suite of sen symptoms and try to figure out uh, what can this, uh, you know, its own DNA can tell you about the disease. So really, I mean, it's, it's an amazing time to do genetics and um, I'm, I'm very, very lucky that way uh, to be doing this, this kind of work right now. Well, and that, and that work is really fitting in, you know, some of the things that are happening right now or like the big thing that's happening right now in our world, right? Um, so one of the questions that we have received from our audience is, can SARS-CoV-2 uh, one day become part of the human genome? Um, what kind of benefits can it then have? I can try to take a crack at this one because this is very close to the work we do in my lab, actually. Because as, as I told you, we study this DNA that's derived, that's been assimilated, integrated into the human genome, and now it's part of us and cannot be removed, essentially. Uh, so we do not have any pieces of DNA in our genome, at least in the reference genome. Again, this is like sort of this universal genome, this kind of generic human genome. No one that we know has a piece of DNA that's derived from this coronavirus that we, are, we know about now, unfortunately. Uh, however, we do have pieces of DNA that, that's derived from viruses that are not too far from these, so, you know, not, not too close either. And um, one of the things that we found in, in, in my lab is that sometimes this uh, viral DNA that's integrated in the genome can be used, in fact, to fight against circulating exogenous, we call these infectious viruses. Uh, as a decoy or as a molecule that can block infection. Now, we haven't seen any, anything like this with the SARS-CoV-2 right now, um, but of course, it, you know, it would be very interesting to look a little closer. 
Um, so can it be integrated? Can it become, so to get back to the question, can it get integrated into your human genome? Yes, it's conceivable. Uh, it's very unlikely, however, because this type of viruses, the coronaviruses, do not integrate their own genetic material in the material, the genetic material of the host cell that they infect, unlike other types of viruses. So it's still very unlikely. Yes. You know, as long as we're on this topic of, um, you know, SARS virus and the COVID-19, um, Dr. Kashat, can you talk a little bit more about um, kind of the, the shape of the virus and um, how it does infect humans? Sure, I can. Although it's moving away from, from the topic of the human genome because that's a very different type of genome. So every virus is have their own genome. Um, so uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, genome is a coronavirus, and this has an RNA genome. So RNA, you know, is this sort of intermediate molecule between the DNA and the proteins. And this one is only exists as, D, as RNA, never makes DNA only. This is why it doesn't get integrated in the human genome, for example, not very easily, because it makes an RNA copy of its own RNA through enzymes that are very unique that humans don't actually encode. So the virus encodes its own genes. So these genes that we talked about, this is one of the things that we were talking about earlier today, is that, you know, we talked about humans having their own DNA and every species on earth. But in fact, these viruses have their own genetic material. And some is DNA, some like herpes viruses or pox viruses have DNA genomes, very kind of similar to like a human genome, if you want. But this one has an RNA genome kind of like the flu virus too. Uh, so, however, unlike the flu virus, the other thing I would say, and I won't take too long here, um, is that it's a very complex uh, virus. Coronaviruses actually are fairly long and encode multiple proteins. Of course, nothing like a human genome, which encodes about 20,000 proteins, different proteins. This one would encode about, about 50 or 30 proteins, I guess. Um, so, you know, much, but, you know, flu, the flu would encode only like, you know, less than 10. So it's a relatively complex virus, but nothing like the complexity of the genome as, as, of a multi, multicellular organism like humans or flies or even plants, right? These are much more complex. Is that, is that complexity one of the challenges that scientists are, are racing to, to find the, the cure for this right now? Yes, uh, certainly, and also complexity and lack of information because these type of viruses have not been studied very much, even though some caused uh, a, a very serious outbreak almost 20 years ago already, and we kind of were warned that these viruses would actually spill over again uh, it was very predictable that way. There was not a lot of work on coronaviruses uh, overall. So we still don't, and it, they are complex viruses. So we do not quite, you know, know very well these viruses. So yes, certainly that's why there's, there's a lack of treatment and there's also issues of diagnosis of testing because we just don't know these viruses very well. Oh, thank you. Um, so, Dr. Garcia, um, we have a question from our audience, and you know they would like to know how much DNA do mice and humans share? Mice and humans? Yeah. Um, well, that depends. Like uh, Cedric was uh, um, alluding to before, to what you compare as the genome. Uh, so, in terms of the genes that we share, we share more than ninety percent uh, of gene identity with uh, between mice and humans. In terms of the non-coding sequences, there's a lot more variation uh, between our, our genomes. And um, unfortunately, that's, that's one part of the genome, as Cedric can attest of, that we don't know very much of. And we don't have a lot of studies across the species to back up like how functional uh, that is and what the importance is of that part of our genomes. We know that it is important, certainly, uh, but we don't know to which extent. That's quite a bit, 90%. I wouldn't have guessed that. Yeah. Uh, and so another question from our audience uh, for Dr. Garcia is, you know, uh, what are, are there specific challenges that you've noticed uh, in this field as one of the few Latina women working in genetics? Um, 
Well, um, the world is, uh, works the way that it does. Uh, so I, I, I'm lucky to say that I, as a woman, I've never feel, felt, been felt, feeling discriminated against uh, as long as I entered in science. Um, being a woman poses differences and, uh, and different challenges as well uh, to continue work-life balance and, and things of this sort. Um, I think that the, the most difficulties that I have found uh, have been since I have kids, quite honestly. Um, I just feel that some part of society is not really ready to assume that both parents can be working and that the kids um, need to be taken care of at the same time. So it's always a split between my family and, uh, and my work. And that's, that's the major difficulty that I have found. But I have to say that in terms of my, my colleagues, um, uh, the value of my research, I, I've never felt discriminated uh, myself. That's great to hear because that has definitely been a challenge for women in, in sciences for, for many, many years. And I think everybody who has kids, especially right now, can can agree with how challenging it is to to teach kids to the, and be a teacher and also be a parent to them in in this social distancing where we're all staying home and trying to juggle so many different different roles. So I commend everybody who is 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 doing those different roles. I'm gonna switch over to uh, Chris. And can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, what really attracted you to this film in particular? I think for, for, for us as filmmakers, I mean, we're looking for stories that resonate, stories that are compelling, and stories that have some kind of universal theme. And I have to say, genetics, the gene, has that in spades. You know, these genes are made of, of DNA and um, in some cases, you know, in the case of viruses, uh, you know, RNA, its cousin. And, and that's what binds us all. We often forget that. But we're, from wherever we are as humans in the world, whether we're tall, short, you know, fat, thin, black, white, we're all made of the same substance. Every plant, every animal, going back billions of years. And as far as we know in the universe, this has happened only once. I mean, this, uh, this, this creation was, was made only once. And so there's something mesmerizing about that. And you take that and then you realize that this, this gene, and you'll see in, in the series, uh, when they go wrong, they can just cause the most devastating effects on families. And we can look in every community, I'm sure we all, all of us know people who've been affected by genetic diseases, whether it's um, cancer, which might occur in your lifetime, which almost certainly has you know, a large genetic component to it, uh, to some of the rarer diseases. And the understanding, Cedric was talking earlier about the impact of the Human Genome Project. And that really has been profound in terms, of, in terms of being able to understand these diseases, in terms of being able to read the genomes of a cancer tumor, to read the genomes of a child who is incredibly sick. And you know, a few years ago, doctors would have had really only their experience to turn to. Now they can read the genome, and in many cases, they can find out, they can pinpoint what is going wrong genetically with that. And then in some cases, it's a minute fraction now, but the hope is that this is it's going to be more and more. In some cases, there are life-changing um, uh, medications or even diets that can be given to these children or these families. And so we're... we're so it not only is it compelling because it's so universal, but also it's so timely because it's not just the pandemic, but we're at this exciting moment. People like Dr. Garcia and Dr. Fisher are doing just research that is really gonna be transformative for so much of our understanding of who we are and understanding of some of the worst diseases that afflict us. Sure, that was amazing to go through that journey and be able to see some of those, those, those compelling stories and be, be part of it. Uh, so now we have another question uh, from, from the audience and for Chris, you know, what, what um, was really challenging being the director of this film? I think the, the hard thing, there, there are two things that were fairly challenging about it. I mean, most of us, um, I'm going to include myself in this, um, you know, barely remember biology. I never studied biology and genetics. So a lot of the science is quite abstract. Um, 
And then the second thing is, has been finding, finding stories that are going to resonate, finding stories that are going to bring home the, the power of genetics, the importance of understanding genetics. And I would say that on, the reason why we should all be informed is because we are at such an important moment. Our generation is one that for the first time in human history is able to manipulate genomes. And you'll see at the, the, at the end of the film a story of the embryos that were manipulated. So they will become adults and if they have children then their genomes will be affected. And they will be the first, they are the first people in history who Whose, whose genomes were, were altered, not by evolution, not by, you know, you know uh, a sperm and egg coming together, but by human intervention. We can do that now, deliberately. And that power is daunting. It will open up so many fabulous treatments, so much amazing research, but it's also ethically problematic. I mean, who gets to decide what changes are made and, and to whom? who gets to decide how accessible these, uh, this genome editing is broadly to wide swaths of the population. Um, and so these are, these are all hugely important issues, but to be part of the debate, and we should all be part of this debate, we need a basis, we need an understanding of genetics and how, a fundamental understanding of genetics and how it works. Otherwise, we're, otherwise the debate will, will, will pass us by. And it's an important one to be to be having. Um, I have a question. It's a, it's a comment question, and it's actually for um, Dr. Garcia and, and Dr. Fashak. I was really affected by the start of the film, eugenics, the Holocaust, and the extraordinary ability we now have to tailor make our babies. How do you both feel about the birth of the twin CRISPR babies in China? Uh, Dr. Fashak, do you want to start? Sure. <clears throat> well, there was many things that were shocking about that story. Um, one of which is the choice of the disease that was being treated and the way it was being treated was, didn't make a lot of sense. Um, in a sense that this was actually something that could be, in fact, I don't know, if it wasn't told in the, in the, in the, in the screening, but what, what was, they were trying to attempt is to uh, uh, modify the sequence of a receptor for HIV, for the virus HIV, uh, in a child that was born from parents, at least one, I don't know if the, both of them were positive, one of which was HIV positive. So they were trying to prevent the transmission of, this, of HIV to the child that was being born. Because it's a constant threat as a parent. However, it's not a lethal threat by any means. You can do many things to prevent this to happen and protocols are already in place. So in a way, in a way it's, it's a strange choice if you want, if, if you were to want to do this. Okay. Uh, and secondly, uh, it was very clear from the community that this was, you know, a step that you shouldn't be taking to go into germline modification because the big difference with what we've heard in the document, in the screening, in the documentary about modifying uh, what we call somatic cells. These are cells that are not gonna be passed on to the next generation. They're just gonna stay with you like blood cells. Even stem cells, we heard about blood stem cells in the screening. Those you can modify more, it's more attacky, it, 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 it take the uh, okay because they won't be passed on to the next generation. But here, by modifying the germline, uh, the early embryo, it's a modification that would never go away, like as, as Chris said. So this was clearly something that was not supposed to happen. And the whole entire scientific community voiced that very loud and clear. So this was in, infringed. Uh, there's many other issues I don't need to get into, but, you know, it was not a very smart thing to do. And I think everyone now agrees with this. Yeah, um, I, I felt pretty much the same way. I, I felt that it was crossing a very important line uh, in our 
ethic protocols as scientists. And I just, I just felt it was broadly unjustified. Um, what really went close to my heart as both a developmental biologist and as a mother is how as a parent, you, you do something as risky with your, your own children um, with, with an experimental treatment. It's something that could affect them so profoundly for life. Um, so that, that affected me uh, to my heart more than as a scientist, uh, so to speak, like how as a parent, uh, not only as a scientist, you, you, you agree to do something like this. Yeah, it really gets into those questions, right? Of, um, you know, what do we do in the name of science and what, what, what do we feel is really right? And so I'm gonna stay on the same uh, thought with a, a similar question from our audience, and this is for Chris. Did you intentionally include Dr. He's work, uh, eugenics and the monstrous, the monstrous interpretation, which was the Holocaust together deliberately to highlight CRISPR though powerful, can be terribly misused, as was the concept of eugenics during the Holocaust. The um, good, great question. The, I, I, mean, I mean, partly they appear so close together because of the nature of how we've shown these clips from the film. In the actual film, they're, 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 they're quite far apart. But I have to say that, that throughout the history of genetics, there has been this, this light and dark, this yin and yang. With every, with every step forward, it feels like almost. There have been, there's been the risk um, or the threat that it would be misused. And we first see this in, in eugenics in, in the late 19th century, in the Victorian era in England. It migrates, as we see in the clip, it migrates to America, and America becomes this very enthusiastic adopter of it. And it's based on a, a, you know, a limited, erroneous, really, understanding of genetics, of heredity, of how information is passed from one generation to the next. And you would think that that lesson would have been learned, but you see it coming back in, in the 70s and in the 80s and 90s. It almost seems to be this idea that, that, that will not die, that the, the smarter we get, the more we know, the more we truly are able to, to make changes that someone deems beneficial. Um, and I love Eric Lander's uh, quote at the end of that clip on eugenics, uh, reminding us of how careful we need to be, and also how informed we all need to be to make sure that this, that this doesn't happen again. And on the Dr. Hay story, I have to say that we'd almost finished the film. I mean, these, these films are huge enterprises and take a long, long time to put together. And we had almost finished the film when word emerged about this experiment um, and, and the outcome and the, the uproar. And I remember Sid Mukherjee, the author of the book, calling us and um, alerting us to us and saying, this has, to be, this has to be a central part of the film. We have to make it a central part of the film. So we actually ended up reorganizing the film and reordering some of the stories and put it right at the beginning of the film. So it becomes this sort of, this, this, this question of, 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 of advance and of sort of, the, of shadow and light, of, of, of progress and, and darkness moving hand in hand becomes a sort of quite a central important theme throughout. And then you'll see that it's amplified, the story is amplified at the end of the film where we talk about AIDS, the background that Dr. Fashot has been, has been explaining to us, the nature of that experiment. But it's hugely important. And every lab in the world is pretty much is, is using CRISPR. It can do things quickly and cheaply that really have not, that, you know, have been possible before, but have been so complicated before. So the hope is it's going to accelerate understanding of who we are and how we go. Things like the, the SARS, this, this coronavirus, so much of the understanding of what it is, why it's so harmful, how it works, is moving ahead rapidly because of all that, all, because of this history of science, because of this basic science that's been done on the AIDS virus, on the flu virus, on viruses and CRISPR, and using techniques like CRISPR to, to unpick it, to unpick that genome and understand how it works and why it does what it does, and to hopefully to kickstart the search for vaccines. Absolutely. Um, so, Thank you. I have a question that I'm just going to throw out to, to the group and see you know, who wants to jump at it first, but this was a question from our audience. 
And it was mentioned that genetically speaking, there's no difference between races of people. However, race is more of a social construct that formulates an identity based on phenotype. How can genetics help break down these racial barriers? So who would like to tackle that one first? Oh, so that's a tough question. So uh, it's going to be a problem to find someone to answer it. So I'll, I'll, I'll try my best. Um, so, um, so the question of, of genetic differences, of course, there are genetic differences between races, as, as there are between all of us. But the point that the film is trying to make is that those differences are minimal and they don't affect who we are as humans. We are part of, of the same human species. Um, so it depends on a cultural level uh, what is it that you consider to be different? Uh, that's my, my view of it. It's a personal view more than a geneticist view, I believe. Uh, but I, um, I truly believe that the differences that we have as uh, different races only bring strength to the human species as a whole. So um, I think that that's something valuable to preserve and that we should all acknowledge that uh, more than what we do currently. That's great, thank you. Talk yeah, to just that. to say, it was very well put, it, just to add one, one more bit. I mean, I just, I just really liked the way it was put, put in the documentary that indeed there is a lot more genetic variation, in particular between Africans than between a single white Caucasian person and any given Africans, right? So I think that was very well explained, better than I can do actually in the documentary. And so, yeah, it does just, you know, um, remove scientifically this idea of that, at least at the genetic level, uh, there is a, a genetic basis to re-races as we perceive them. I think it, it, it was very well put together. I agree, I agree. Um, so we have a question for um, Dr. Fisha. From your virus background, if such spillovers constantly take place, and I'm thinking they're talking about the, the COVID-19 SARS, if such spillovers constantly take place or are taking place, what can be done at a global level to avoid the next SARS-3? Is it just a question of when and not if? That's a, that's a tough question too. <laughs> um, well, no one knows really, no one can really tell how much spillover from animals because we, we, we do know that all the disease, all the viruses that are causing disease in humans come from animals. Okay, there is essentially no exception to this. Okay, uh, so yeah, the spillover are important. We need to monitor them. Uh, it's difficult to do so. And, it, and, it, and the other thing is that, indeed, I think that question points to the difference between the, the, the spillover, so the one-time transmission from an animal to a human, and then an epidemic, and then a pandemic, which is a yet another level. And, and for example, Ed's HIV gives a good example of that. So we all know of the HIV pandemic. This is caused by a virus called HIV one which indeed jumped from chimpanzees to humans somewhere in Central Africa once maybe a few times before and then for a number of reasons not just biological reasons but socio-economic reasons the, the development of, um, of uh, transportation within cities and so on travel and so on became a pandemic but then there is another experiment, sort, of, sort, of, sort of experiment that took place, which is another virus that causes AIDS-like symptoms called HIV-2, which was also acquired from a primate. It's called a Suti mangabe. So it's this, this thing from HIV-1, but it caused very similar disease. But that one never went out of Africa. It's still actually a disease in Africa, and some parts of Africa is actually serious. But no one talks about it because it didn't become a pandemic. So the point is, I think that shows, suggests that indeed the jumps from animals, the jumps of viruses from animals to humans occur on a regular basis because we do eat animals. So we are in contact with animals in many different ways. 
Um, but whether then it becomes a pandemic is a whole different question, right? So, so I don't have a, an easy answer for this question, but I think it's, it's probably safe to say that jumps from animals to viruses are much more common, fortunately, than what the, the pandemics or epidemics that we see, the out, outbreak that we see. I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> I don't, it sounded really good to me. <laughs> I, think it, I think it does. Um, I'm just going to remind our audience to please keep your questions coming in the chat. You've had some wonderful questions tonight. And also, if you haven't registered to sign up for a 23andMe DNA cap, please go ahead and do that as well. That link will also be in the chat. Um, so I have a follow-up question um, for you, Dr. Fischette. What are some of the reasons that not every human becomes sick when they are infected with SARS-CoV-2? Well, I don't think anyone has the answer to this, okay? <laughs> Certainly, I am not an expert on coronaviruses and I, you know, so, and, and certainly not about the pathogenesis of these viruses. But I think it's part of this, the answer is probably in our DNA, is in the host factors. We know this is very well established that there's tremendous variation in our immune system between humans. And again, this is something that completely confound the races and all of that. We can be even closely related and we will see very large variation in our ability to respond to infection, how our immune system turns on or turns off actually, which can be even more important in this case because actually most people get sick, not because of the virus itself, but because of their response, which is sort of exaggerated if you want. So it's likely that's because of genetic variation, and we don't know yet, but there is ongoing studies and we're actually looking at this in my own lab. Many other people are looking at this. It's likely that there are variation in the sort of cellular factors that you know, either fight against the virus or facilitate the, the, the replication of the virus that vary in their expression between humans. And that is part of the answer, I think, of why you see some, some people even regardless of age, even if you're controlled for age, you would see some people react very strongly, even young people, and some don't, completely asymptomatic. So probably part of the answer to this puzzle is in our own DNA, in, our, in the variation that we have uh, in, in our genomes. Uh, and then there is environmental factors, of course, and there's many other additional factors. So probably the answer is much more complex than that. But that's my answer. <laughs> Well, that was a good one. Dr. Garcia, do you want to add anything to that? Um, like uh, Cedric can probably respond better than I do. Um, I would just say that also the environment can play a big role and we don't know how, role, how important the role of the environment, like previous viruses that we've been exposed to and how our immune system reacted to them may allow us to react more strongly or less strongly against this particular strain of virus. Um, so the environment that we have been exposed as individuals may also play a role. Um, we will know on time, I guess. And can I just add one thing there, Nancy, as well? Because um, Sid Mukherjee actually wrote a really interesting article for anyone who's interested in reading a bit more about it from a, in, in layman's terms. Um, he wrote an article about it last week in the New Yorker magazine. And one of the other factors that he was talking about, in addition to the environmental factors uh, and the genetic factors that um, Cedric and Mira were talking about, is also the viral load uh, factor as well. It seems like a lot of people working in medicine are being struck down, again, regardless of age. And it may be that repeat exposure, or as, as Dr. Garcia said, you know, prior exposure to other viruses affects how they respond to this one but he lays it out in a very accessible way in a piece that he just wrote. And it's a really interesting overview of, of knowledge. Now the field is changing hugely, very, very rapidly uh, as, as we throw so much research, so many resources at trying to understand this, but it's a, it's a great roundup for people who are interested. That's great, thank you. I'm gonna, this is a question for everyone. Um, do you have a favorite gene and why? <laughs> 
I, I like the MCR one G myself. <laughs> um, Which is for I have many favorite genes. Uh, probably the ones that are my favorite right now are the ones that we're working on in my lab. Um, but they all have weird names. Uh, Give us one example. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this one is kind of funny. Our last publication is a, is a gene that encodes a calcium ATPase, and the acronym for the gene is SPCA1. Uh, so whenever I was giving a talk, people talked to me about, does this anything have to do with the SPCA uh, association and animals? Like, no, nothing to do with that. It's just a, a lucky coincidence of the acronym. Um, this calcium pump, by the way, is very important uh, in the development of uh, spina bifida and, and neural tube closure defects uh, in animals. And um, it is, is, uh, it's been a great discovery in our lab and um, a great project altogether. Great, Dr. Fisher? Oh, I have many. <laughs> well, there's one we're working on right now uh, we're finishing a study uh, that was led by a graduate student in my, my group, which is called suppressing. It's a human gene. And actually, it's, it's a cool one because it does, it's borrowed from viruses. So it was once a viral gene, just one that would contribute, one that contributes to the entry of the virus into the, into the cell. It's called an envelope. You hear maybe these days about the spike protein of the coronavirus, which is give it its crown-like thing. So this spike interact with the receptors on cells to get into cells. It's like a key that gets into a lock. And it turns out the suppressing is, in, is a virus. It's derived from a virus. It used to be a key that the virus used to enter cells. But now we encode the key the ourselves. And so, and, but it's interesting because it's a broken key. And so what we found is that this broken key gets into the lock that's used for all the, by all the viruses so that now they can no longer infect human cells. So it's an antiviral proteins derived from a virus. So we like to think about this as fighting fire with fire. So these are the kind of things we study. So it's called suppressing. So you can look it up, although there's not much known because it was essentially completely unstudied, right? There's only a couple of papers on these, and not in the context of an, as an antiviral molecule. So it gives, I think it should give everyone hope that there is even things in our genome that we can use to fight against viruses like these coronaviruses. Yeah, and I would say I have two um, favorites that emerged from the making of the film. And the first is Huntington, is the gene that's associated with Huntington's disease, a terrible degenerative disease that strikes people. And one of the reasons it's so pernicious is because it strikes people in middle age. So they usually, they tended not to know that they had it until they, uh, after they'd had children. And so the disease was spread down through families for a long time. And the story of the discovery of that gene is just one of the great stories of, of medical and scientific um, detective work. Um, and it's told in the film, there's beautiful footage of that history. But the, the, the bottom line is that it was, it was most readily seen in a huge family of patients with, of, uh, patients with Huntington's in Venezuela, in a small village. Um, they live on a lake, in, in fact, in stilt houses on a lake in Venezuela. And an intrepid researcher went down there in the late 70s and 80s for many, many years, working with this huge family to finally uncover that gene. It took decades. This was before the Human Genome Project, before automated sequencing really had come online. So this really was a manual, monumental effort done globally. And it's just a, it's just a wonderful story of, of of the beauty of of the beauty of science and the power of the, the power of determination. And then the other one is at the opposite end of the spectrum for me is a, is a gene called KIF one A K I F one A. And we also tell that story in 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 the film. We don't know a huge amounts about it, but I challenge anyone not to be moved by the young girl Susanna, who um, whose journey we tell, and that of her her father Luke as they try and understand the gene, find more families, and then ultimately find possible treatments that will 
help stop the degeneration of, of her and, and the small number of other kids in the world who have that disease. So those, those are the two that really stuck with me in the course of making the film. So speaking of um, making the film, we have a question from the audience, Chris, for you. What does the research look like to make a film like this one? You know, how do you come up with topics to cover and control the message you're trying to send? Great question. Well, the first thing is you're, you're seeing just me um, and I'm just one person and a large, large team that, that worked together for several years to make the film happen, to bring it to the screens. Um, the second thing is, in, in the case of this particular project, we had a, we had a, a template. We had, we had Sid Mukherjee's wonderful book to start with. Uh, and so that gave us a lot of, a lot of stories. Uh, the challenge there was choosing which stories to include in the film. Because the, the history of genetics is so rich. But what we ended up doing was focusing as much on the present day as on the history which Sid tells. So a lot of fresh reporting went in to making, to uncovering stories and uh, finding researchers and families that could help us bring this to life. And so what it involves is myself and, and the whole team really reaching out to people such as you know, Dr. Garcia and Dr. Fashot that you're seeing now, just people who are just articulate, who are on the front lines of, of this hugely exciting science of genetics. Some work more with patients, some work more on basic science, but really trying to reach out to as many people as possible um, and then find a balance of stories that are going to help bring this to life and create something memorable for, for viewers. Well, I think you've done, done a great job. It's been a wonderful team. Um, I have a second follow up to that. Um, thinking about everything that's happened and what's been going on in our world, it's very easy to create a fear of genetics, especially from you know, what has happened in China. How do you feel about the responsibility of these documentaries to show both sides of genetics um, should, could be the cure to many incurable diseases nowadays? That's a great question, and that's what's so exciting about genetics today. The, there really is uh, an ability to understand the, you know, take cancer, which is hugely common disease, uh, generally not uh, inherited genetically, but the changes within cancer, or, you know, often well, manifest themselves in, in genetic ways, even if they're sparked by an environmental lesion, or by sunlight, by sun, you know, uh, sunlight or by smoking or obesity or so on they, they, they will manifest themselves in in a genetic way and the our ability now to sequence those to understand what's going on just gives us an, an ability to if you're a scientist to make a rational um, to make rational progress in trying to understand how they evolve and to try and combat them. And that's brand new. That really is something, I think the audience really needs to understand that, um, that that is, that is totally new. So, and then you look at the multitude of rare diseases. There are about 30 million Americans have rare diseases. That's one in 10. Some of these diseases may only affect a few people, they may have a few hundred people, maybe a few thousand people, but 30 million across the country means that almost every family is gonna know someone that's affected by one of, these, one of these diseases. And again, by knowing the genes, we tell the story of spinal muscular atrophy. They discovered the gene in the mid nineties. It meant that scientists and then physicians could take a rational uh, approach to trying to combat that disease. And what we see now is a, not just one, but a number of treatments that change the life of patients that are born with this disease. The hope is that this will become possible for many other genetic diseases. Uh, we're just at the start. As one of the doctors says in a film, we can now see the light at the end of the tunnel. But before, before the human genome, before this progress, we really, really were in the dark for so many diseases. 
Well, we've come a very, very long, long way. <laughs> and I wanna thank you for all the work that you've done putting, putting this uh, great documentary together with, with your team. Uh, we are getting close to the end of our time. So I just wanna turn it over to our panelists. You know, do you have any final words or thoughts that you wanna share with our audience tonight? I'm gonna to start with you, uh, Dr. Garcia. Um, just want to thank everyone. Uh, congratulate Chris on this wonderful documentary. I'm sure that he's glad that he's finally seeing the light and I'm very happy to watch it. Um, just uh, a final uh, say away that uh, uh, learning about science is the responsibility of, of everyone. And we are, we're growing into a society where, where knowledge is very important. We scientists are regularly not very good in publicizing ourselves or publicizing our discoveries and we rely on, on people then like Chris uh, make our science and the discoveries that humanity has reached up to this moment available to the general public. So uh, thank you for that and thank you for those of, of, of you that are watching this and, and want to seek information and always learn more. Uh, uh, that's really what motivates scientists and I think that it should motivate all of us humans as well. I couldn't agree more. Dr. Fischak? Oh, yeah, we'll keep it short. This was a great conclusion, Maria. Um, yeah, I was, you know, I watched this, this, the, screen, the screener before and I watched it again and I got a little bit more, even more moved this time, seeing that graduate student at the NIH that's working on our own disease. And it just reminded me that we can, everyone can do it. Everyone can contribute. You don't, you, don't, you don't have to be a geneticist, actually. Uh, you've seen our mom is there contributing, too. Um, so that's very inspiring for me. Um, and in these days, we are being told this, you know, by like staying home, you're saving lives. And so that's the same kind of message. I think it's a very positive message that we have a, all a little, bar, a little part that we can play. And I also... There is, for me, something very inspiring and positive in the midst of all the sort of gloomy uh, feelings that we have these days about what's happening right now is that um, science is at the, at the center, right? And I think it should, <laughs> maybe, uh, you know, I know I'm biased, it should always be, but now is a very strong reminder that where we need to invest is in the science. And you know, the basic science oftentimes is what can en enable the response that we are kind of lacking these days to this virus. Uh, but everyone can contribute in their own way, not just us, the scientists right now. Yeah. Thank you. I agree. That's great. And Chris, do you want to give us some final, final words before we wrap up to this evening? Sure. First off, Nancy, thank you so much. And Cedric and Maria, thank you so much. It's just been a fascinating discussion and just thrilled to be able to share our work with, with all of you and, and get all your great questions. And one of the pleasures of the film has been delving into the, to the world of science. It's not one I knew a huge amount about, but I have to say that the, the, you just, the, the people working in this field couldn't be more inspiring. The curiosity, the drive, the determination, the fascination with what they do, the enthusiasm. I mean, these are all things that I think we should all be cherishing and, and, and appreciating. Um, and not just because we're in the middle of a pandemic, but because they're unseen heroes, really, for, for, uh, that drive so much of, of, of what makes us better people. So thank you for joining us and I'm thrilled and hope you get to see the film um, and hope you enjoy it and find it informative. But thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I do want to announce the winners for our 23andMe DNA kits. Uh, so we have Antoine Dumas, uh, Kate Solis, Jim Conklin is also a winner, Clement Goubert, and Kirsten Frisbee. Uh, we will be reaching out to you via email to get your information so that we can send that out in the mail to you. So thank you so much for being here tonight and attending and participating. I also want to thank um, our wonderful panel. So thank you so much, Chris Durant, filmmaker for The Gene, uh, Dr. Cedric Fashat, Dr. Maria Garcia. Thank you so much for adding your voices and your expertise 
uh, to, this, to this discussion tonight. It was really wonderful. I also want to thank our WSKG team behind the scenes of tonight's screening, Bailey Norman and Jackie Stapleton. They help to keep things running smoothly for us, so thank you so much. We invite you to stay connected with WSKG at WSKG.org or on our social accounts. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please take a moment right now to take a survey that is placed in the chat. This event was made possible by a grant from PBS station WIDA, and we would greatly appreciate your feedback. You can catch the Gene and Intimate History coming this Tuesday, April 14th at 8 p.m. That will be the second part of this series on WSKG TV, or you can stream the entire thing from beginning to end on the PBS app. Just go ahead and search the Gene. So please again, please take time to take that survey. We would really greatly appreciate your feedback so that we can continue bringing programs like this. And thank you for being so flexible and tuning in tonight. I know this is a different way of doing outreach events, um, but we are embracing it and we are so glad that you are here with us tonight. So thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you enjoyed this evening. Thank you so much and good night. <laughs>